So, Professor Rademacher, Dr. Weber, ich bin Ihnen sehr dankbar für die Einleitung. Und Und ich bin Sie alle auch sehr dankbar, dass Sie mir die Freitag, Nachmittag oder Abend gegeben haben. Weil jeder hier spricht Englisch, so ich will auch Englisch. Uh. <laughs> you know, it's, um, so now you are, many of you going to become uh, researchers and professors. I give you a warning. When you make a prediction for 50 years into the future, normally you expect you will be dead before anyone is able to see if you are right. <laughs> but in my case, I have only three more years uh, until it will be 50 years. So uh, tonight I'm trying to get ready for that time and I created a speech which is uh, called 47 years uh, after limits to growth. I'm going to think back on this period and try to decide uh, what lessons can be learned. To do that requires all of us to look at the situation in a slightly different way. So I'm going to give you practice. Cross your arms. You too. <laughs> so look down and see which wrist is on top. And remember, OK, drop your arms. Great. Now, cross your arms and see which wrist is on top. So we are all scientists. Let's do some scientific research now. Everyone here who had the same wrist up both times, raise your hand. Almost everybody. So it must be some optimum technique. Let's see. Everyone who had the left wrist up, raise your arm. Everyone who had the right wrist up, raise your arm. So this is interesting. It's about 50-50. Uh, but you would expect that. Crossing your arms is a habit. A habit is something you do automatically so that your brain can focus on a different issue. It would be a big problem if every time you want to do something that doesn't need your arms, you had to spend two or three minutes trying to decide what to do with your arms. So you have a habit, you cross your arms, and then you can start the job. And we have many habits, very many habits. They help us to get through life. But sometimes the circumstances, the conditions change. And the old habits don't work anymore. And then we need to have new habits. So I give you practice. Cross your arms the other way. So there's uh, three lessons in this little exercise which we need to remember tonight. First, it is possible to take a different habit. But two, you have to think about it. It's not easy. And three, when you are trying to develop a new habit, initially, you might make mistakes. It's natural. Now we need to develop new habits about our use of energy, travel, the economy, and so forth. We can do it, but it's going to require that we think about it. And we shouldn't expect that we don't make mistakes. So when your leaders stand up, 
give them the possibility that at first they may make some mistakes before they know how to do it differently. So uh, here we are in Ulm. Es ist mein erstes Mal here. Erstes Mal here. Bin sehr froh here in Ulm zu sein. And tonight I'm going to address five questions. So what did we actually do 47 years ago? Uh, Professor Rademacher mentioned that 30 million copies of the book were sold. Many millions of people thought we were right. Many millions of people thought we were wrong. Most of them actually didn't read the book. <laughs> so I'll tell you what we did do uh, 47 years ago. And what did we forecast? What were the main conclusions uh, at that time? 1972 was a very different time from today. Uh, we didn't think about such things like climate change and so forth. The ocean seemed to be so large it would be impossible to have any impact on the ocean and so forth. How accurate were those scenarios? Still a little early to tell, but after 50 years we began to get some uh, ideas. I remember I stood up the first time in 1972 to present our results from out to the year uh, 2100, and almost immediately after the speech, someone uh, from the newspaper came up and said, well, Professor Meadows, were you right or wrong? I said, you know, we're going to take some decades before we start to have uh, an understanding. Another question, number four, what would we do today different, uh, given that I hope I learned something in 50 years? Uh, if I were doing again this project, how would it be different? And uh, finally, looking ahead now, what do we see? Many of you will have your professional life over the next 50 years. It's quite interesting to imagine what you or for others, your children will be living in over the next decades. Of course, impossible to say precisely, but we can see some broad uh, aspects. So first question, uh, what did we do 47 years ago? So at that time, I was a young professor in the Lehrstuhl of uh, Jay Forrester at MIT. Forrester invited the Club of Rome to come to uh, the United States to study our computer modeling techniques. And he developed a very simple theoretical model that he could use as a basis for teaching. Let me say, incidentally, I'm going to give all of these slides to Professor Rademacher. So you shouldn't spend any time writing down the slides. At the end, you will be either happy that you didn't waste your time uh, writing them down, or happy that you were able to focus on the important uh, issues. So Forrester developed this uh, theoretical model. We used it for teaching. And then uh, the Club of Rome decided that they would like to use this method uh, for their research. So I put together a team of 17 scientists, analysts, uh, including uh, two from Germany. They are now retired professors, I guess. Uh, Peter Milling, Eric Zahn were uh, students at that time. They came and worked with me. Uh, I told Azada, who's in Professor Rademacher's Institute, I had also one Iranian scientist uh, working with me at that time. And we spent uh, about uh, a year and a half gathering data and trying to understand the important theories about population, food production, natural resources, pollution, and industry. 
In those days, gathering data was much more difficult. You don't just type into Google uh, you know, historical data on the population of the globe. You had to send somebody down to Washington, D.C., and they would look through the books and try to find uh, the numbers. So it was a much more difficult job in those days. And then we took all of this data and these theories, we put them together into a computer model of the globe, and we did many scenarios, many simulations, uh, because, of course, it's impossible to make a prediction precisely about the future. But if you make many different simulations with different assumptions, you can begin to see some central tendencies. And we took those and put them into three reports, three books. The first you heard about, uh, The Limits to Growth, Die Grenzen des Wachstums, auf Deutsch, uh, and then two more, which you never heard about. Um, and you never will hear about them. Uh, we didn't make predictions. A prediction you can make, let's say, in astronomy, at, where you can predict the eclipse of the moon or something. But uh, in social systems, there is uh, impossibility. We don't have enough knowledge, and there's a random component, so it's impossible to make uh, predictions. Uh, but we did generate scenarios. Scenarios are internally consistent images of, of the future. And we ran these from 1900 out to 2100. The first 70 years gave us some comparison with history, because we know those data and then 130 years uh, into the future. Then, because you don't know things precisely, even now and for sure not in the future, we made uh, some big changes in our assumptions. We, for example, doubled how much natural resources would be available. We changed the amount of arable land. Uh, we made many changes in uh, technology for controlling births and so forth, and generated 11 different uh, uh, scenarios, focusing on these five main variables. Notice we looked at the globe. We didn't look at poor people, rich people, north people, south people. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, even today, the knowledge which we have doesn't give us meaningful forecasts. If you make a stupid assumption and then replicate it 50 times to represent 50 different countries, it's still a stupid assumption. Uh, so it's uh, no point to do it. This is uh, an example of uh, scenarios from population. So we were here in 1972. You see the history is known. And then, depending on assumptions, you see different results. Some of them quite favorable, so-called uh, sustainable development. And some of them pretty catastrophic. Population growing very high and then falling down. So how was it? Well, uh, in that time, we came up with some main insights. The first mistake that most people made was to imagine we said growth had to stop or would stop immediately. Actually not. You can see we expected uh, that growth would continue for another 40, 50, 60 years. But we saw that the conditions which produced growth up until 1970, if they weren't changed, would cause very serious consequences later. It's like the guy who falls off a high building, and he's coming down, and at the tenth stroke, somebody looks out the window and says, how are you? And he says, well, so far, so good. <laughs> the most common behavior we call overshoot and decline, going past the boundaries and back down. At that time, economists didn't think there were limits, but if they would admit to a limit, they somehow imagined that the market 
would bring us into a very gradual, even, orderly adjustment to that. And we said no. Because of the delays, because of the erodible stocks in the system, the tendency is to overshoot and, uh, and decline. We were at MIT. My first uh, degree is in chemistry. I have been a professor of engineering uh, for probably 30 years of my life. So we do understand about technology, and we put into the model many different technological assumptions. What we found was technology doesn't eliminate limits to growth. It shifts the burden from one limit to another and may push back a little bit the period until things start to go down. But of course, technology itself doesn't change the problem. Technology is a tool. It's used by people and institutions. And you can't understand the future unless you understand the goals of those institutions. In order to get attractive results, we had to go outside of technology and look at social and even economic changes. And we came to understand that the problems we talk about today, climate change, uh, pollution of the oceans, and so on, some, they are not problems. They are symptoms. They are symptoms that the globe is starting to mount pressure to stop growth. In one way or another, population and material and energy growth have to stop on a finite planet. And so it comes to question, what are the pressures which will stop that growth? If they come from us, they will be fairly attractive, like birth control. If they come from the planet, they will be fairly unattractive, like uh, famine or war or disease. But one way or the other, these uh, problems are going to come. And when we talk now about solving the problem of climate, it's on, we aren't actually addressing the problem. The problem is growth in a finite world. So how accurate were our scenarios? It's surprisingly difficult to answer that question in a scientific way because the data are still quite poor and they are manipulated uh, for political reasons by countries. Uh, I mean, we even don't know how much oil is being uh, still left in the ground because different countries have different political motivations to lie about that. Uh, nonetheless, you can make some uh, I guess. Population is probably one of the variables where we have the most accurate data. This shows the history from 1972 up until the present. And these were the, so, so you can see where the history is more or less uh, in the middle of what we projected. But notice, not on the sustainable development path. We are in the midst of our overshoot uh, scenarios. Uh, this is uh, food production per person. Here again, uh, actually here, the, we weren't very accurate. We, the history shows that food production has been much lower than we expected. And of course, it's under severe pressure now from climate change. There have been other studies uh, recently in Australia the uh, CSIRO, the Commonwealth Scientific Industrial Research Organization, undertook a study. This is uh, a photocopy of their results. They took a standard overshoot run and a standard sustainable development run. So they took two of our 11 scenarios in each case. This is for population, for industrial output, for non-renewable resources for pollution. And then they plotted historical data just to see. And what they find is in most cases, the historical data is right on the standard run. But of course, note, we didn't get to the peak yet. So of course, we don't know for sure uh, what will happen next. But so far, at least, they say that our scenarios are quite accurate and that the world is behaving uh, in the overshoot mode. 
I could speak at great length to try and convince you that there are limits and that there will be overshoot and so forth. I'm, I don't waste your time. Um, you wouldn't come to this meeting if you were skeptical about that. Uh, by and large, only people come to my lectures who already believe these things. Uh, so let's skip and go to the more interesting questions. What, what to do today? How would we make differently today a global model from the one we made 50 years ago? In many sectors, I actually wouldn't make many changes because we still don't have good theories and good data. For all of the research which has been done and all the numbers which are available, the underlying wisdom that we have about humanity hasn't improved very much. But there are some areas. In the first model, energy resources, oil, coal, natural gas, uh, are included in the overall category of resources. And I would take them out because all other resources, I think, can be substituted quite well. Copper for or aluminum for copper, copper for aluminum, uh, and so forth. But you can't substitute something for the energy resources. So it's useful to pull them out. Of course, if you pull them out, <clears throat> then you can start to take track of CO2 emissions. And they are, in our model, in the so-called persistent pollution category, but because of climate change, they have a special role. I would pull them out. And a big difference between our model and reality is how much money we spend on military hardware and the military generally. In our model, that doesn't show up. So our model is extremely optimistic. And if we took out that money, uh, it would reduce the possibilities which exist uh, in the other sectors. I still wouldn't separate the model into different countries. Uh, actually, as we have seen since we built the model. Some countries have changed, like the Soviet Union, quite a bit. And I'm quite sure between now and 2100, many other countries will change. So the, the countries are not a fixed unit of analysis. And we anyway aren't able to make wise statements about what governs the flow of people, energy, information, and so forth between countries. So I wouldn't separate the countries. We were criticized because we didn't have prices, but I wouldn't put prices uh, into the model. Finally, over a period of uh, decades or centuries, the prices are simply a, a mechanism for allocating, and if you don't have something, it doesn't matter what its price is. You won't allocate it. I think by looking at the underlying physical scarcity, you have a much better understanding, so I would not put in prices. Uh, and I wouldn't make technology a separate, independent actor, autonomous. You hear always the, question, the statement, well, technology will solve our problems. That's, a, that's a really a stupid uh, statement in a way. You know, it's, suppose I have a hammer and I hold it up. It's a very useful piece of technology. But now you ask me, what will it do? Well, it depends who's holding the hammer. If the hammer is held by an artist or a, a fine cabinet maker, the hammer is a technology which makes beautiful things. If that same hammer is held by a killer, for example, or some stupid person who doesn't know what it is, it does nothing. The benefit is not in the technology, it's in the goals of the person who has the technology. Most of the money in the world today to develop new technology is going for military technology, certainly in my country. And if you spend money to develop weapons for enforcing power and killing people, you don't get a technology which is going to solve hunger, climate, and so forth. So we have technology in our model, but the technology is driven 
by needs, by the goals, by the perceptions of the people who are in the model. And there are long delays. It can take 15, 20 years between the discovery of some fundamental new idea and its widespread impact on society, even if it's positive. So it's important to put in technology, but you need to be very clever and realistic about how you represent what causes it and what it causes. And the key thing to know, these, technology, these changes don't change the fundamental limits to growth. The planet has a certain amount of space, land. We can alter a little bit. You can take salt out of water. This gives you a little bit more fresh water and a little bit less salt water. Um, but these are minor, minor changes. And the other reason we wouldn't change is that actually the globe already has overshot. We are far above the capacity of the planet to provide food and materials and energy, even for seven and a half billion people. If we had one billion or maybe two billion and a wise government, we could afford for everybody to have a living standard like we have. But with seven and a half billion, it's absolutely out of the question. Uh, this is a graph from uh, Matas Fakenagel. He's a Swiss scientist now working in the States. He's called, uh, he developed his concept of the global ecological footprint, which uh, is very complicated and probably wrong in certain ways, but it's the best I've seen of our ability to get some sense about the carrying capacity of the planet. Notice that quite by accident, our report was written back here when we still had more or less the possibility to support everybody. Not, now we don't. And there are many other ways to think about limits. Uh, this is a scheme developed up in Stockholm where they took at 10 different planetary limits it's an early stage of research. Uh, this is somehow the idea of the safe boundary. If uh, in the case of ocean acidification, they say, well, we're not quite up to the boundary. But in areas like uh, the loss of uh, biodiversity, for example, uh, the adding nitrogen into the, we're way, way past uh, our carrying capacity. Anyway, wherever you look, there's evidence that we're beyond the limits. Actually, the climate is uh, every day a reminder about that. So what do we forecast for the future? Well, I tried to think about Germany and the south of Germany, um, which will be relatively favored uh, in these coming decades. Sea level rise is not such a big problem here uh, as it is in Bangladesh, for example. And you have quite a bit of money. And many of these problems, the rich can buy out uh, a solution. If others are starving, you can buy food. If others don't have energy, you can buy energy. You can't buy a better climate. Uh, you can't buy protection from nuclear uh, proliferation. There are some things you can't buy out, but, but generally speaking, you'll be slightly better off. There is going to be significantly more climate change. We know that from the physics uh, of the system. Even if today everyone in the world stopped emitting CO2, uh, the fluorocarbons, uh, and uh, the other important greenhouse gases. Even if we brought them today to zero, the climate will continue to change for at least a century, maybe longer. And of course, we aren't stopping. We're every year increasing our CO2 emissions. What does it mean? Well, we don't know for sure because the tipping points uh, are not fully understood. These self-reinforcing cycles that start, you know, if. If you melt all the ice off of the Arctic, then more sunlight is absorbed, which makes things warmer, which melts more ice, etc. It's a 
positive feedback loop, which when it starts means finally the climate doesn't care what we do about CO2. It has its own dynamic. It's always useful to remember we care about the climate, but the climate doesn't care about us. This is one forecast from Jorgen Ronders, who was one of my colleagues uh, in the first book. <clears throat> and we are now here, about 0.7 degrees of global average temperature change. Under very optimistic assumptions, we might be able to stabilize four times higher. I can't personally imagine what kind of climate disruption comes with a four times greater uh, amount of temperature. But it, the key point is, it will be very different uh, from today. Uh, so what does that mean for Germany? Well, you can make a list as accurate as mine, but I just to remind you of some of the things we are speaking about here. More frequent heat waves. Uh, I stayed in a very lovely hotel in Munich, but out in the garden were uh, air conditioning pipes because their air conditioning system is no longer big enough to keep the rooms cool in the summer. They have to put in uh, more, and they are reacting to the past. They don't think about the future. So more frequent heat waves. Rising sea level, which actually, of course, doesn't bother you very much directly, but it's going to force many more immig immigrants uh, into Europe. Uh, I mean, who knows? But I was speaking last night. My guess is, you know, the, the amount of pressure which you have now is 5 or 10% of what you will see in 30 years because of sea level rise. Uh, weather is driven by heat. The heat in content of the atmosphere is going up. So we will see more extreme weather, droughts, floods, winds, so forth. That has uh, some impact on food production uh, in many ways. One interesting trend is that as the CO2 increases in the atmosphere, the food quality of the plants goes down. The nutrition level uh, goes down. So even if you're producing the same tons of mice, it isn't uh, so nutritious uh, as before. Uh, the biosphere will be simplified, more pests. Uh, and uh, energy is uh, going to be more expensive because, uh, for example, uh, let's take Switzerland. Interesting problem, what will happen in Switzerland? Their electricity comes mainly from dams. The dam water comes from the glaciers, and the glaciers are going to disappear. So what happens to the electricity? I don't know. It's interesting. But it, it's not going to make it cheaper. Talking about energy, we have quite a different issue. Uh, for reasons I'll show you in a moment, I expect that energy is going to become more expensive uh, because of we are depleting, uh, using up the cheap supplies. Uh, of course, Germany has been very, very successful in developing renewable energy. You are, you know, everyone is uh, excited and respecting of the example of Germany, except maybe the Germans aren't, but everybody else thinks it's fantastic here. Nonetheless, it's still quite a small percent, 14%. Uh, not even half of what you're getting from oil or natural gas. Uh, <clears throat> and it's those which are going to become more difficult. Every year since 1984, every single year since 1984, the world has used more oil than it discovered. So in the early days, 30s, 40s, 50s, we discovered these huge oil fields, the so-called elephants. And we are still pumping them down. But when it comes time to find new discoveries, we're not even replacing what we use. So there, slowly the amount of oil under the ground available to us is coming down. It was predicted that oil production would peak out in 2016. A very interesting 
German think tank called the Energy Watch Group, uh, just outside of Berlin, uh, did a detailed study and figured that by 2030, oil production globally would be half of current levels. Then the United States discovered uh, shale oil, and now we have this little bubble. And of course, the Americans are so proud and think, well, this really changes everything. It's a minor and fairly short uh, thing. I think even already by 2020, uh, the shale oil will be going down, and, and we will be back uh, on this curve. Germany has been very successful in reducing its energy use. I mean, it's, it's amazing uh, what you have accomplished despite very rapid uh, economic growth. From 1990 up uh, to the present, that's your total primary energy consumption. So primary energy means, for example, how much you put into the electrical generating facility, not just what comes out. It's, it's the important number. And it shows, again, renewables, mineral, oil, going down a little bit. Uh, but still very high. So what is this going to do for Germany? A very interesting one will be the shifting power relations between those who export energy and those who import it. You import. Russia exports. And as you know, a key issue is the extent to which Germany becomes involved with Russia in uh, relationships that permit a lot of, mainly gas, to come over here. Uh, I, it's not my field of expertise, and uh, you're not interested in my opinion anyway, and actually I'm not interested in my opinion, so I don't give it. But uh, we can say that this is one of the key factors which is going to unfold over the next decade. The pressure on the energy system will not permit Germany to ignore this question. You're going to have to explicitly make some decisions about this. Uh, because energy prices get higher, the economic growth is going to slow down. That has all sorts of uh, political consequences. You know, uh, we have Trump in the United States, partly because so many people in the United States see that the economy isn't doing anything for them, quite the contrary. So in desperation, they start to vote for people like that. Uh, <clears throat> when you eat food, every calorie of food on your plate typically has about 10 calories of energy behind it to produce, ship, manufacture, cool, cook, and so forth. So you can imagine, if the energy price starts to go up, the price of food is going to go up. And this, these things always relate to, to, to political change. I uh, received my award this morning in the Hofkirche uh, of the residence in Munich, and I observed that that church was started by a king. It was destroyed under a dictator and restored under a chancellor three different governmental forms. Each of those people certainly thought they would last forever, and they were swept away. So it's an interesting question, what comes next? I don't know what's going to come next, but I know that we are not in a period of stability. <clears throat> certainly in my country, the political system isn't even working for the current circumstances. It certainly doesn't uh, work uh, for the future circumstances. and changing structure of labor force. One statistic, which is, I always found interesting, in a society which gets its energy principally from renewable resources, pasture, forest, crops, in such a society, 80% of the labor force has to be in primary production. That leaves you 20% for your military, your priests, your governments, your artists, but 80% are out there actually generating energy. Now, the amount of people who generate energy in our societies is down in a few percent. But as the cheap energy sources go away, the labor force is going to have to shift back into more connection uh, with energy production. 
These are not new ideas. Uh, long before the computer was being used, there was an interesting book. Actually, I recommend it to you. I don't know if it's in German. Probably it is. Called The Challenge of Man's Future. It was written in 1954. And in that book, Harrison Brown, who was a professor, he was at one time uh, chairman of our scientific uh, council in the United States, had this to say. I leave you to read it. I don't bother to say it. <clears throat> It's an interesting idea, and we see it with renewable energy, for example. You can't produce solar panels or windmills by cutting down trees and using cows on pastures. You need fossil fuels. And if we somehow don't manage to get onto the next phase before we finish with this phase, we lose that possibility. It's a, it's a very interesting act, which most people, I think, uh, in the governments don't understand. OK. Um, now, when you look at my curves, there's always a tendency to imagine that the greatest problems will be after the peak, when things start to go down. That's what you think, oh, that would be a pretty terrible time. Actually not. Uh, this assumption is not correct. In order for that peak to happen, the pressures against growth have to be big enough to equal the pressures in favor of growth. I mean, that's simple dynamics. Those pressures against growth are what we call problems. So the biggest pressures have to occur at the end of the growth phase. That's where we are now. In the next 30, 40, 50 years, we are in this period where the pro-growth and the anti-growth pressures are coming into equilibrium in order to stop the growth. We're just in the early period there. I, I gave a speech in Vienna, I don't know, 19, or 2010 maybe, something like that. And I said then, the changes what they will see in, in Austria in the next 20 or 30 years will be greater than the changes that they saw in the last century. Changes in economy, in governance, in environment, living standards, and so forth. Uh, and I said that with a full understanding of the enormous changes that there have been in Austria. I mean, 100 years ago, it was a great empire. Uh, now, not, et cetera. Well, we're moving in that direction. And I would say again the same thing. We don't know exactly what's going to happen, but I know for sure when you or your children are looking back, let's say from 2050 on this period, you will see huge changes, which we don't now, of course, anticipate. Uh, you know, I mean, if I had said to you uh, 10 or 15 years ago, the euro will disappear as a common currency for the European Union, uh, or Great Britain will vote to leave the European Union. You would have said, that's just a crazy idea. But now these things are, are happening. Uh, we are seeing weather in the United States, which is setting historical records. We've, uh, we've never in our recorded history seen uh, such floods and such temperatures and so forth. It's, and it becomes almost uh, common. Uh, you, you, you quit paying attention to it almost. So what to do? Well, that's always, of course, the bottom line, uh, what to do. This came out in 1972, and I think it's still true. Until we stop physical growth on this planet, there are going to be more and more problems. Everyone says, well, yes, obviously. But then you say to them, well, uh, we don't have enough labor force. What's the answer? We have to increase our population, bring in young people to work in the factories. Uh, or we have poor people. What's the answer? We have to make the economy bigger so that we have more money uh, for the poor people, et cetera. Or people don't have enough to, to eat. What's the answer? We have to produce more. So the growth is the automatic, habitual response to these problems. Nobody yet fully understands that we just have to stop. You know, it's an interesting question for Germany. You solve 
you could solve many problems by bringing in more people if you do it in a wise way. But then 20 or 30 years ago, from now, you again have these same problems, except now you have a lot more people with many different cultures. So, you know, it's um, what I had in the United States, we, we had the, called it the redwood problem. The redwood are these very special trees. They get very large, but they take centuries to grow. They're very valuable wood, and there was a whole industry based on harvesting the redwood trees to make them into different kinds of products. And then the environmentalists said, well, we have to stop cutting these redwood trees. They'll disappear. And the industry said, well, we lose jobs. We can't. It's impossible to do it. But the point is, they're going to have to stop cutting redwood trees at some point, either now or when there aren't any more. And the options you have are better if you stop now than if you wait until later. This redwood problem faces us with energy, with population migration, and with many things. We just have to switch over. One of the most important books I've read recently it was written in Japan. It's called Negative Population Growth Economics. What does it mean to have a society and an economy where the population is going down instead of up? Uh, even in Japan, they don't have any interest in this book. It's not known. And they are now starting, because of the stable population, to try and import uh, special immigrants to, to provide uh, workers. I, this morning, cited the quote of uh, Jean-Paul Juncker, who said, you know, we know what to do, but we don't know how to get reelected if we do it. It's the main dilemma of our democratic system. A democratic system has many benefits. Uh, I'm personally happy that I live in a more or less democratic society. But it has the disadvantage that the people we elect pay attention to what's going to happen between now and the next election. They don't necessarily work for the long-term benefit. When you have problems with short-term dynamics, that's fine. But when you have problems which take a century or two centuries to solve, a uh, one or two year electoral cycle just simply doesn't work anymore. And we need to start thinking about different ways to capture the benefits of electoral democracy, but to bring a longer term perspective into it, to give our representatives the power that they could be reelected, even if they do something which only has negative results over the next 10 or 15 years. There are, in the United States, no energy policies which are good for the long term that don't impose serious costs on the short term. The best thing we could do in the United States now is to raise the price of oil so that people would start to economize and find a substitute. But no politician will vote for that because they know they would lose the next election. Uh, quit giving so much respect to the market system. I, could get off into a long discussion about that, but uh, it's boring and probably also not relevant here. Uh, there's been this mystique, some magical ideas about the economic system, and they are just, it's a swindle and a fantasy. And uh, soon we're going to have to start understanding that the neoliberal notions of competition and so forth uh, simply aren't working for us. Uh, and a key thing, we have to start understanding the long delays. I remember when my former president, actually wasn't my president, but the president of the United States, uh, Bush said, well, you know, when I see a climate problem, I'll do something about it. The point is, of course, when you see a climate problem, it's too late because it's uh, like being on the Titanic and you put a guy on the front with a stick, and he says, when I feel an iceberg, you know, I'll do something about it. But of course, at that point, it's impossible uh, to do anything. Remember the delays. Of course, the politicians always like to say that the solutions are on technology. It makes it easier for them. But actually, the good results are going to come from social and political 
change. Uh, one of the most th serious problems uh, in the economic system is this notion of discounting, trying to compare future costs with uh, current costs. There was a brief moment when the Stern report came out on climate where there was some possibility of a significant change. And then the economists started to say, oh, forget about it. The discount rate he's using is too low. And if you make a higher discount rate, you see it's economically irrational to do anything now about climate. Rather, we should keep going as we are. And then later, we can use all the money which you accumulate in the short term to solve climate problems. It's, it's just a, a, a totally false way of trying to understand uh, this, this thing, you know, the precautionary principle disappears uh, under uh, discounting. R my mother had a very different approach. She didn't go past high school. She never went to college, but she was quite a wise woman. And you know, uh, she said many times, if you can't afford to lose, don't gamble. That's a more interesting way to think about how to compare current and, and future problems. Uh, the government <laughs> tends to hope or think that these problems are going to come one at a time and then we can just deal with them one at a time. But of course, and this we showed already in 1972, they're all interconnected. Uh, to solve uh, the climate problem, we have to develop uh, photovoltaic panels. But to develop photovoltaic panels, we have to use a lot of special minerals. And in order to get those minerals, we have to do uh, use a lot of water and pollute a lot of water. And in order to purify the water, we have to use elect a lot of electricity, and that gives us back more climate problems. So everything is interconnected. And if you want to solve these problems, you shouldn't imagine that you look at one problem, figure out the solution, look at another problem, and so forth. And also, of course, realize nobody exactly understands what's going on. We, don't, we simply don't know. We don't know what's coming. Uh, so rather than trying to design a solution to some future problem, uh, which we predict, we have to design our system that it can deal with a whole wide range of problems uh, and, and until we find out what's coming. It's the shift towards resilience rather than uh, sustainable development. Uh, and of course, I don't have to tell you this. Uh, you know, Everybody makes mistakes. Uh, so many of our policies, for example, with nuclear power, are based on the idea that we're going to do something which will never make a mistake. That's a, a totally silly idea. There will always be mistakes. Uh, uh, the government is now building a data system which is designed on the idea that nobody will ever make a mistake which lets that data out into uh, b bad hands. It's a totally strange idea. There will be mistakes. We have to build a system that can deal with it. So my friend Amory Lovins used to say, don't try to be fail safe, try to fail safely. Build a system which can have mistakes and still gets on. Fukushima was an example of a system designed to work perfectly as long as there were no mistakes. And as soon as there was a mistake, absolute unmitigated catastrophe. Uh, and quit trying to go back to past conditions. It's, uh, that's not one of our possibilities. The, um, you know, the political, they liked, they liked this period from about 1990 up to 2000. You know, it was peaceful, there was economic growth, the environmental problems weren't very serious. It was a beautiful time. And everybody's saying, oh, how do we get back? It's gone. We're, we're moving in a different direction, and we need to, just to be realistic about that. And here, a practical suggestion for this campus. Focus much more on resilience. How do you build systems that can accommodate shocks and chaos and continue to function? This idea is elaborated in some physical systems. But when we think about government or cities or your family or even the university probably, 
Uh, this idea of resilience is still not uh, very well explored. Uh, resilience is a science. It has some standard principles and theories which can be mapped into different areas. It's extremely important. Uh, for example, in agriculture, we know there are going to be enormous shocks coming from temperature, from drought, from uh, floods, and so forth. And we need new research to develop the seeds and the techniques uh, for doing it. OK, well, I could go on, but now it's time to quit. I'd just like to show you one more quick exercise, which is actually the most important thing I conveyed in the whole evening. In just a moment, I'm going to ask all of you to clap your hands like that. Don't do it yet. And this is not a tricky way to get applause. There's actually a, <laughs> there's a serious uh, method here. <clears throat> so in a moment, I'm going to ask you all to clap your hands at the same time. And if we're successful, then it will, outside, it would sound like there was a giant in here who clapped their hands. And here's how we do it. I'm going to count to three, slowly. One, two, three. Then, now don't do it. Then I will say, clap. And precisely at that moment when I say clap, we all clap our hands, OK? I'm going to count to three. Then I'm going to say clap. And then you'll, OK. One, two, three, <laughs> clap. This is a scientific audience, right? <laughs> the point here is a very, very uh, important one. Actions, our actions, have much more influence than our words. Of course, you understood my words. It was totally clear. But as soon as my actions were different, you pay attention to my actions instead of my words. It's going to be like this with these problems. The fact that we have new words to describe them means nothing if our behaviors don't start to change. Thank you very much.